afternoon everyone. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties. Um, we had a little little problem with uh, our USB uh, not working, so you'll have to bear with us today and uh, we will have an enjoyable and informative session nonetheless. So welcome to today's seminar at Ithaca House. My name is Peter Raftopoulos and I'm the president of the Ithaca Historical Society. I'd like to thank the Ithacan Philanthropic, Ithacan Historical and the Events Committees for supporting this in-house event and all the hard work they've done in the background to stage this. And also thank you for attending here today and uh, appreciate your time uh, for this event. I'm sure you'll find it very informative and enjoyable. Today we have a very special guest visiting us today from Greece and she's in fact from our very beautiful island, Ithaca. I'm sure like myself, she tried to bring a little of the sunshine of Ithaca through customs uh, a week ago, and uh, we certainly succeeded because uh, today there's a little bit of Ithacan sunshine outside and on this uh, winter day in Melbourne. Our guest is Dr. Georgiana, Georgiana Moraito. So she's from the Aparillis clan. Uh, her Paratsuki is Aprilis, so if you're Ithacan uh, and related to the Aprilis, you're no doubt related to uh, Georgiana. She hails from the ancient town of Anoyi, uh, which is uh, uh, a wonderful ancient town on Ithaca. She's an archaeological conservator. She's the head of the Department of Conservation, Physical, Chemical Research and uh, Archaeometry Archaeometry of the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. She studied conservation of archaeological materials and material science in London at the Institute of Archaeology and further to her studies with a PhD at the Technical University of Athens. She's here in Melbourne as a member of the National Archaeological Museum team for the deinstallation of the highly acclaimed Open Horizons Ancient Greeks Journeys and Connections exhibition that took place from the 23rd of April to the 14th of August at the Melbourne Museum. However, her relationship with Australia goes far deeper and is ever more dearer because her own grandfather, Nicholas Moraitis, also who originated from the village of Anogia in Ithaca, immigrated to Australia at the beginning of the 20th century. With his brothers, Spiros and Dinos, they owned and operated the renowned Morris Cafe in Hindley Street, Adelaide, as documented in the books, cafe, uh, Greek Cafes and Milk Bars of Australia by Alexakis and Je uh, Janowitsky in their book. Today, Dr. Marayito will be speaking to us on the topic of bronze masterpieces at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The story of their discovery, conservation, and mounting for display. The National Archaeological Museum in Athens includes in its collection a considerable number of the most important bronze statues of ancient Greek art, which was accidentally found at the bottom of the sea. Had they not sank with the vessels that they sank on that transported them, they would have been lost forever and recycled as precious metals. After being exposed to an underwater environment for two and a half thousand years uh, or more, they were covered with marine organisms and completely disfigured. This is where a conservator comes into the scene to release the archaeological findings from their disfigured crusts and mount them for display in a museum gallery for all humanity to enjoy. Dr. Marito, please take us into your world of discovery, conservation, and stunning exhibitions. Hello, Ithacan Philanthropic Society. Hello, my friends. When I was clearing out my parental house, I found a paper clipping among other memorabilia, my grandfather's passport, his medical papers. And it was a paper clipping dated 1954 with 
the label of the Ithacan Philanthropic Society. As Peter said, my grandfather originating from Anogi, Ithaki, came to Australia in the beginning of the 20th century, where his two brothers were already here in Adelaide, and they run this uh, restaurant coffee house called Morris Bros Cafe. So I'm very honored and very moved to be able to address to you today in Melbourne. I'm really sorry that my PowerPoint didn't reach Melbourne because I would have shown you more insights of the statues I'm going to present. Anyway, thanks to Anna, we did a new PowerPoint in five minutes. <laughs> So I'm sorry for the uh, of the, some of these pictures are not very good. Anyway, so the National Archaeological Museum in Athens is one of the oldest and greatest museums in the world. It contains the richest collection of artifacts from Greek antiquity worldwide. Its abundant holdings, featuring more than 20,000 exhibits, cover elements of Greek civilization from the beginning of prehistory to late antiquity. The museum celebrated in 2016 its 150 years from the foundation of the building. The National Archaeological Museum holds a unique collection of large-scale monumental bronze statues whose acquisition started at the end of the 19th century. All these statues, as Peter said already, were accidentally found in the bottom of the sea. The source of most of the existing bronze monumental statuary. The reason we rarely find bronze statues in land excavations is that they were either looted by the Romans or the metal was recycled in antiquity. So the main source of existing bronze statuary heritage is the coastal underwater sites. After being exposed to this underwater environment, the statues were covered with marine organisms and completely disfigured. This is where a conservator comes into the scene to release the archaeological finds from their disfiguring crusts and mount them for display at the museum galleries for humanity to admire. Bronze statues are hollow inside. This is a technological feature that permits the installation of an internal skeleton which serves in the mounting of the statue on its base. In my talk, I'm going to present the story of seven iconic bronze statues discovered in the course of one century, from the end of the 19th century all through the end of the 20th. The succession with, with which the statues are presented is following the date of discovery. Poseidon of Livadostra. The statue was restored, uh, sorry, in 1897, a bronze statue of Poseidon was discovered in the Bay of St. Vasilios in Boeotia and was transported to the museum. The head was found intact but the body was recuperated in 19 fragments. The statue dates to the 480 BC in the early classical era when movement was not yet released. There is an inscribed inscription on its base of a dedication to Poseidon. The statue was restored and mounted in the years after its discovery, most probably by the sculptor Kaludis, who was employed at that time in the museum. In his first restoration and mounting, the right missing foot was restored in plaster. Today we see it is de-restored. From an archival survey, it was made clear that the statue was re-restored in the 30s, the 1930s, and in the 1970s. 
It is in the 1970s that the gap filling of the right leg was removed. But it is in an X-ray performed at the archaeometry laboratory of the museum that the internal structure used for its mounting was revealed. What is very important in the restoration and mounting of a statue is its posture. This is why restoration must be interdisciplinary. An archaeologist is indispensable in the team work, but a sculptor is also essential, as was the case in the mounting of the Poseidon. Not only was it mounted by a sculptor, but a university professor sculptor was consulted for the redressing of the statue. In 2015, the statue was re-restored in order to be displayed in the exhibition of the National Archaeological Museum Odysseys. In 1900, the famous Antikythera wreck was discovered by sponge divers from Simi at a depth of 60 meters off the island of Antikythera. The shipwreck dates back to 60 or 50 before Christ, approximately. Many marble statues were found in its cargo, most probably looted by the Romans. Among the findings was a bronze bigger than life-size statue. It is dated between 340 and 330 BC and is probably the work of the sculptor Ephranor. Its attribution still remains problematic. It might be Paris holding an apple or Perseus holding Medusa's head or even an athlete. The statue was lifted in five pieces from the seabed by the sponge divers with the assistance of a ship of the Royal Navy under the surveillance of the archaeological service. Its conservation was allocated to the Greek chemist Othon Rusopoulos, who desalinated it in tanks filled with tap water in order to eliminate the sea salt. He then cleaned and stabilized the metal using an electrochemical method, which unfortunately ruined its green patina. The Greek Archaeological Service looked all over the world in order to find a specialized restorer for the assembly and mounting of the statue. They finally allocated the task to the French sculptor Alfred André from Paris, France. Over the years, archaeologists were not satisfied with the patina and the posture of the statue because, as they claimed, no archaeologist was consulted. As a result, in 1957, under the direction of the archaeologist Christos Caruzos, the statue was taken apart and re-restored. The result was approved by, a scientific, by the scientific community of the time. In 2012, the statue was exhibited in the temporary exhibition of the National Archaeological Museum, the Antikythera shipwreck, the ship, the treasures, the mechanism. We see a picture of uh, this statue in the permanent exhibition. The Ephib of Marathon. This statue was discovered in the Bay of Marathon in June 1925. This is a work dated to the late classical period, 4th century BC, associated with the school of Praxiteles. The master craftsman who restored the statue was Stylianos Klavianos, who implemented the conservation of the statue under the surveillance of a scientific committee. In a rare photograph, well, unfortunately, I don't have this picture. It shows this statue upside down while being immersed in the water tank in order to be desalinated. And then the statue was displayed in 2018 
apart from the permanent, of course, exhibition. It was displayed in the temporary exhibition of the NAM, the National Archaeological Museum, the countless aspects of, be aspects of beauty in ancient Greek art. In 1926, in Cape Artemisium, in the northwest of Euboea Island, the left forearm of a bronze statue appeared in a fisherman's net. The find was reported to the Archaeological Service and transported to the National Archaeological Museum. <coughs> Two years later, in 1928, divers lifted the right arm, broken off from the body during the operation. Some days later, the body was lifted by the authorities and brought to the museum. The statue depicts either Zeus or Poseidon. Scholars have not come to an agreement yet. It is the highlight of the museum, a classical work of art dating to 460 BC, the fifth century and attributed possibly to the renowned sculptor Calamis. I think the Hellenic Museum here in Melbourne holds a copy of this statue on, in display. Because of its importance, its conservation was allocated to an interdisciplinary committee. President of the committee was the chemistry university professor Constantine Zengelis. Assembly and mounting of the sculpture was performed by a sculptor, assisted by a watchmaker and, a sculpt and another sculptor. In the photographic archive of the museum, a number of photos were found revealing details of its mounting. We found glass negatives of the time depicting the restoration of this find. In 1930, the statue was placed on display as a centerpiece of the permanent collection. In 1970, the statue was x-rayed. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture. And during the war in the 1940s, the statue was wrapped in tar paper and hidden, it was hidden under the floor of the National Archaeological Museum as all the masterpieces of the museum and then buried and covered for the Germans not to find it. They came to Greece, they opened the National Archaeological Museum and they found it empty because all the antiquities were hidden under the ground. The horse and jockey from Artemision were lifted in fragments from the seabed in the years 1928, 1929, and 1936 in Artemision, again in the north of Euboea. They were found in the same shipwreck in contact with the statue of the god at a depth of 42 to 48 meters. First, the fourth part of the horse was lifted with its head and left front leg. Next, the statue of a small boy was found from which the right leg and right arm were missing. Investigation resumed in 1929 when more fragments of the horse and jockey were found. By 1930, the jockey was displayed in the museum, but it was only in 1936 that the rest of the horse was recovered by chance. The sculptor George Castriotis made drawings of the fragments of the horse and studied its anatomy, and the sculptor Andreas Panagiotakis made a plaster cast of the equestrian statue. Since the front and rear part of the horse did not join, there was a range of possible lengths for the figure. Conservators went to the hypodrome in order to study the uh, horses racing in order to restore this horse. 
Um, okay, since I don't have the pictures, I can't tell you the rest of the story. Let's go to Augustus. <coughs> this is a bronze equestrian statue of the Roman Emperor Augustus Octavianus, dating to the years 12 to 10 before Christ. It was recovered from the sea between Limnos and Agios Efstratios in 1979. It is said that it was lifted by fishermen from a depth of 100 meters. Only the head and the torso with its hands are preserved. The horse was not found. The statue was conserved and mounted at the Metal Conservation Laboratory by conservators Hatiliu, Cassandris, and Komunakiris. It is worth looking at some details on the surface which give the statue a polychrome look. A band in pure copper and a meander on his cloak. These bronze statues are where before they were uh, corroded, before corrosion, they were shiny, golden a little bit. So when you, where the sculptor inlays pure copper, then there is a difference in the color of the metal. Pure copper is red. So you can see the band coming down on his cloak. Last but not least, the statue of the Ephib of Saarbrücken is going to be presented. It was confiscated in Germany in 1998 in the city of Saarbrücken, hence its name. It was looted from an underwater site, possibly Preveza. It was repatriated in 2002 and exhibited for the first time in 2004 in the exhibition Aron, the spirit of competition in ancient Greece, organized in the occasion of the Olympic Games in Athens. Since 2005, it is exhibited at the entrance of the metalwork galleries. It measures 1 meter 45 centimeter, 47 centimeters, and depicts an athlete. The surface was covered with marine organisms. After desalination for 10 months in a water tank, it was mechanically cleaned using dental instruments by the conservators of the Metal Conservation Laboratory of our time. An internal skeleton was fabricated in brass for the mounting of the statue. We followed the story of seven complete or almost complete bronze masterpieces from the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Closing my presentation, I want to thank you all for being here and also those who are going to watch my presentation and video for their time. Thank you. could send my PowerPoint via email and you can upload it. Yep, yes. Peter? So, thank you very much. Anita, before, I'm not going to let it go because it's very rare that you will have someone of such a high calibre. Um, and so I'm going to invite Anita and one of her fellow conservators um, to, to, to come up. Um, because when you go to a museum, I don't know about you, but um, you, you only get to see a little plaque on a wall and often you don't know what work goes into finding these uh, these uh, pieces and of course often I don't know the background and so 
here you have uh, some eminent people uh, that we are so uh, privileged to have today to, to ask these questions. So I'm going to start with a few questions of my own and uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, both of you. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll open uh, to yourself. Maybe you can give us a little... Uh, come, up, come up here, don't be scared. We're, we're all Indians. We're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> we're, we're friendly people, Indians, apparently. Um, I was wondering while I was uh, watching your presentation, is this uh, has this a connection with the internet? Yes, it has. It has. Maybe we could go online and find yeah. some of these. Yes. We might find the way they were the screen size skeleton, like the epi of uh, or the from Antikythera. Yeah. It's quite famous. We might get something. Or your 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 newsletter. Yes. Why don't we go? Well, well, I think while we talk now yes, and maybe absolutely. some images, yes, why don't yes. we go to the site, the National Archaeological Museum, and online, they have, they have get, get into conservation and research, and see your videos from yeah. your laboratory. This is, this is Calliope Tsakri. She's an archaeological conservator, and she works in the Sculpture Conservation Laboratory together with uh, Mr. Panagakos. He's Come sitting up there. Why are yeah, you Come along. Come yeah. along. Come along. We, we, don't see these <laughs> we don't see these mad scientists, uh, you know, up close. So we want to see you, who, who, you, who you are. Science we want to unmask you today and be able to, uh, to, to enjoy your knowledge and, uh, and your work. And so, uh, so we, we'd like to... Um, Yanis Panagakos and Kaliopi Tsakri. Working at the Sculpture oh, Conservation oh, Laboratory. Yeah. And we will have a little session as well. Everyone can ask, ask your questions. Uh, this is your moment to uh, talk to people in the museum that have created these uh, wonderful uh, items. Great, great. Research and conservation. Is there anything else? Yeah, put it on the English side. But do they have the, do they ah, have okay, put it on Greek. I think it's on the Greek side. If you're not Greek, we'll translate for you. <laughs> oh dear, they didn't, oh. they didn't correct the word maintenance. We Is call it, it conservation, it's yeah. not maintenance. Oh, yeah, cool. But they had they had this so mistake. You want me to go to lab, laboratory? Okay. Show us all the pieces and no one gets to see them. This might take a little while to download it. Yeah. While, um, while you're looking, can yes. I just ask a question? Yes. I'm yes. very interested in all this, but I'm um, fascinated to know how long it takes you to dismantle the Horizons exhibition. Or two weeks. Two weeks, yes. Yeah. So Nina, would you like to come yeah, up here yeah, and just explain physically <laughs> what, 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 yeah. you, what you do? Like how and how many people? Okay. Okay, we are si um, a team of six people yeah. coming to Melbourne to deinstall the exhibition Open Horizons. Yes. Three archaeologists here and three conservators here. And it will take us exactly two weeks to deinstall and uh, pack, put them in crates, and then we're leaving next Monday. So, how do you actually de mount? Like, uh, I'm pretty clumsy, so <laughs> do, you kind of, uh, do you use uh, are, are these pieces in one piece or are in various pieces uh, on, on, on the mount? It's a very painstaking procedure because we have to be very careful. We wear gloves, we don't touch antiquities, but with bare hands. Uh, we use trolleys to uh, transport them, never walking with an antiquity in our hands. And they are wrapped in acid-free paper, the small objects, the wrapped, then put in ethafoam, in layers of ethafoam. Ethafoam is polyethylene foam in layers. And there, there are 
cut out spaces, uh, design made, tailor made for every object. Yes. So they are put in these ethyl uh, layers, and then the crate is designed as box in a box with many ethyl and um, soft material anti uh, shock anti shock material. So, and then we put on the exterior we put this tilt tell signs, uh, small um, signs that can tell if the crate was tilted during transport because it has a kind of uh, sand. Yes. Uh, so if it's tilted, the sand goes to another compartment yes. and we can tell. And tip and it tell, it's called. But tip if, if it is, what, what can you do? Uh, then uh, if there is a damage yes. inside, we ask for the insurance company okay. to <laughs> compensate. <laughs> you know, there is a, a preparation uh, of a lot of months yes. to get uh, these results. Uh, as Ms. Moreto said, uh, we design our crates. Yes. Uh, there are special crates for, uh, it depends on the sensitivity of the every object. Yes. Janet, come here. <laughs> come here. Yes. yes. Uh, maybe I could uh, speak in Greek. Uh, yeah. Is it a problem? Yes, some people don't some, speak. Some, some don't speak. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But you're because speaking my, good. You're speaking well. You do oh, very good. Well. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's a big preparation. Yes. Uh, we have, uh, as Miss Moreto said, we have small objects, and we have also big statues in this uh, Melbourne exhibition. So we designed all the tree <coughs> from the from the, the archaeological museum to the laboratory, and then uh, all the trip until here. It's a very delicate uh, job, uh, step by step. That's why we can work for two weeks and yes. pick it up. And all the moves are very specific. We have uh, discussed this with the Melbourne Museum and the people, the conservators at the Melbourne Museum. So uh, every step is uh, well organized. We don't improvise. Uh, we have a, a, a very specific way to lift an object. We have a very specific way to put it inside the crate. We have a, I might say, very well designed uh, crate. <coughs> Mrs. Sacker can tell you more about uh, this if you are interesting. Uh, and also we have some, um, um, yes. Recorders of um, vibration. We, we, we put inside our crates special recorders of vibrations. So we can uh, study uh, every every moment of the trip. Yeah. And we have studied other trips of the past. So we, we know the limits of every object and of every crate. That's why... You can monitor the whole journey. Yes. So you understand if, uh, for example, if, the, if they're in a truck and they have a road trip, whether they, uh, the, the road, the route they, they decided to run, to go, it's bumpy or not. So some, maybe uh, next time you should uh, try another route. And we are with the crates. We are uh, the, the, the yes, and we give uh, um, suggestions to the people. If the truck goes fast, we say go lower. If someone tries to lift uh, an object with a crane, yes. we are here and we give uh, direct directions yeah, direction. of how to do it. <laughs> Slowly, faster. So, will you go on the plane together too? <laughs> yes. Oh yes, 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 yes. 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 So, is it? Can you explain? So, for instance, when it arrived in Tullamarine Airport in Melbourne, tell us the process of getting the statue from from the aeroplane. It was it a cargo aeroplane? It was a cargo aeroplane because the crates were uh, too big to uh, to fit in a commercial uh, flight. What sort of aeroplane was it? Was it a, a, a large one or a, a? It was a large Boeing. 787 I think right. and they they carry only cargo right it's like a it, it, they're called freight freighters and, and freight. you were all passengers on on there or um what usually happens is yes the two couriers or uh, that's what we usually do 
they, they uh, go on board and they have like uh, four or five seats just for uh, these people. And um, we go, we arrive at the airport, uh, usually in Milan, where they, where they have a, a cargo airport. And we place on special metal airplane pallets, they're called, all our crates in special positions. It's and they are secured. Which position every crate should, should, uh, have, on should have on the pallet. And uh, this time we had two airplane pallets. We had 13 crates with two airplane pallets. And we palletized these in Milan and they went on board on the freighter. They had the special, special platforms. Of course, we don't want them to tilt because uh, we have fragile objects inside the crates. So they had these platforms and they put them inside the uh, airplane and you fly off and you have a very, very long journey. You have uh, usually um, at Doha or uh, Doha airport or Dubai airport, they have change planes. Mm. And then, mm. uh, so you have uh, landings and liftoffs and uh, you have to take this into account when you design crates. And, and then they end up after one day, about 24 hours, they end up in, uh, in uh, Australia, Australia yes, Melbourne. So once again, we go to the uh, airport and now uh, we depalletize the, uh, the crates and they are put uh, with the crates and forklifts and uh, with our directions, they are put into yeah. in the trucks that uh, will take them to the museum. Do they have to be uh, customs looking? Do, or, oh yeah, absolutely. What, what, what happens in that, do they? Like I know when I brought some oregano from Ithaca last week, <laughs> no, 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 no. they went through, what, what, what do they we do? Have, we have from? all this uh, paperwork right. with us from Greece, right. from the uh, pro customs in Greece. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, it's just a, a paperwork to be done. So they don't no. actually open anything? No, 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 we no. have stories from, uh, uh, you know, we travel a lot, so yes. we have stories. Uh, there was uh, a case that uh, it, it, they yeah, need to open the crane. And there was a lot of uh, conversation also with uh, the Greek Ministry of Culture if we should uh, open uh, the crane. For, 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 for these exhibitions, there was a long agreement between, for example, Melbourne Museum and the Greek uh, Ministry of Culture. Right. So on those loan agreements, some some things are set up. So sometimes it says that, like, uh, you cannot, you're not allowed to open the crate during the journey. Right. Uh, so Obviously. in that case, we have uh, a little talk so with the people. Like, like a special, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. So, so you have a special um, agreement to, to get things through. Sometimes, yes. Way. Sometimes, but yes. But you need to be there because, you know, things are getting happen. complicated. Oh, yeah, things do Especially happen. Especially with the big statues that cannot go through x-rays and things like that. They are too big yes. and the crates are even bigger. So... I think someone wants to ask a Qu question in the back. Yeah, so I was just, just curious, because um, the, the, the sculptures come from a, a period of time, so mm -hmm. whether they were all from the same foundry from somewhere, and uh, and just the, the sourcing of the copper, is it like gold and silver where there's sort of like a DNA trace so you can find out where the, the coppers come from, which mines, from that, that, which uh, areas? So you're talking about, you're asking about uh, the bronze sculptures, yes, right? Yeah. Yoriana, can you please come upstairs and uh, come up here? Because she, she, I think she's, uh, she's best to. So I think, I think we're just moving off. Just maybe if we just finish off the conversation about bringing the the um, the, the statues to to Melbourne from from the airport, um, and then we can move on to the composition of the actual bronze statues, which we'll ask. Uh, uh, Georgia, in one minute. Um, so, from Melbourne Airport, they were transported in trucks, I, I presume? Yes. To, and they were taken directly? Uh, in this exhibition, uh, they used uh, two big trucks to carry the object. We have uh, uh, two, two crates that was about three meters high, so there was a very special truck uh, came for only these two uh, crates, and the other crates were in a smaller truck. We have um, security uh, to escort us from the airport to the museum. 
and uh, when we arrive at the museum, we have to do the same procedure. Uh, the people of the museum uh, welcome us, and they have also four cliffs. We did the same job. Uh, we unload the trucks. Uh, the and that's where all these are done at, you know, backstages. You, you, it's, we never use the front where people... Yes, I mean, late at night. It was uh, during night. With I a think, lot of security. Right. I think it took us... Uh, we, we, the plane arrives at uh, half past uh, ten. We arrived at the, the museum with the trucks at around uh, twelve. And we finished uh, loading, uh, unloading the crates in the museum around five, five o'clock in the morning. In the morning. Mm -hmm. so, so you did, you didn't leave it in the front of your hotel. The trucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Okay, so. The the crates, the final destination for the first day is to be in a very secure areas with control uh, temperature and humidity, and, and stay there. And cameras. And cameras and everything, and. Uh, because they get a bit expensive, yeah. so I wouldn't leave them outside my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so, does somebody have to stay in the, the uh, particulars all the time, like when they're stored in a room? Does somebody have to go in a room? Yes, Museum has a lot of... Museum has a security and it has a CCTV, uh, yes. so yes, it's but always you don't have to stay. We don't have to stay. <laughs> no, we deliver the crates. This is the first day. And then we have a schedule. Every day we bring a, a, a crate to the exhibition. We have uh, we have worked with the Melbourne Museum at least uh, six months, uh, maybe more, for this. Uh, organize the schedule of the installation. Yes, and so, every day a, a crate comes to the exhibition hall. Uh, open very carefully the crate. Uh, we do the condition report with the archaeologist, step by step. That's and checking the condition of the object to see if it's it's still as it was in our museum yes. after all this long And that the trip didn't affect uh, the condition of the object. Yeah. And then comes, uh, according to schedule, the one that Diana says that we have discussed with Melbourne Museum, and each day one or two crates, it depends on our schedule, uh, will come in the uh, exhibition area, the closed exhibition area. Uh, and be installed on you know the specified um, spots in the uh, in inside the exhibition area. Yes. And, and do, does anyone else? I just want to ask. Um, it sounds like a very specialised area of training that you must have, or education. What was what sort of um, training or education to do your highly specialised work? Did you go through? Um, condition reporting um, it's part of a conservator's training because uh, one of the first things you do when you have an object an artifact is to check it's uh, to diagnose um, quotation the, the state in which uh, it is so condition reporting is part of our training but uh, what we're doing now, query, is something that you don't you, you don't get trained in, in any school in Greece or abroad. It's something you learn, uh, at, you know, during your days at work. And we are fortunate enough that this specific museum, the National Archaeological Museum, has such a plethora of uh, artifacts that loads and loads of museums around the world want to use them in a, the temporary exhibition. So that gives us the chance to be, to have very, very often the opportunity to do querying. Mrs. Uh, Moreto uh, said about uh, a lot of exhibition, the Cypriot of Andy in 2012. Uh, we have worked in all these exhibitions and we are, with the archaeologists, I mean, we are the people that work to create these uh, exhibitions. Uh, I moved to the, the bronze statue at 2012 uh, to the exhibition area of the periodic Super uh, Competitive exhibition uh, you in, know, Athens. in Athens. How does it feel as a responsibility to be holding or moving these priceless objects? 
well, it's sweating. It, it, it is sweating. For yeah. me, yes. You have a very, you, you have a, I feel you have a large responsibility, not just for keep safe, keep safe. Uh, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah keep safe. Keep, keep safe yeah. even for uh, for the exhibition, yeah. but you're, uh, you know, you're it, responsible it, for, for the whole eternal history. People that, yeah, that's yeah, it's for them. So because I, I'm, I'm just awed by just looking at these things, let alone thinking how you would be handling and yeah. trying to fix them and try to, uh, um, you know. Uh, it's a work uh, that uh, 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 combines a lot, of, involves a lot of people. It's not a, a one-man one one uh, show. Right. One one show. Uh, we need uh, to work with archaeologists together. We need to work with all the staff of the museum to get uh, uh, an exhibition uh, done. You understand? Yes. yes. And uh, here in Melbourne, we have to work also with uh, our colleagues from Melbourne to 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 get this uh, wonderful uh, exhibition. Yeah, it's a teamwork. You know, to go for it, to ask the, yeah. uh, I saw a beautiful uh, exhibition in Cleveland, I believe it was 2019, about the Greeks that uh, migrated to Sicily and back. Uh, did you do that physically yourselves? Or was no, it no, 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 no. It was uh, from uh, another museum. Probably, yeah, from another museum, not from ours. No, I don't remember that is used, reuse the craters if you come over here and go back, or will they start from scratch again? Um, well, no, that we do not uh, reuse the crater, or I should say it depends, it depends. If it's, um, if uh, for example, when this exhibition goes back to Greece, if there was a case where uh, an artifact of this exhibition should go straight away to another exhibition somewhere else, and the state of the artifact and the state of the crate was still okay, yes, we would use them again. But generally, for each uh, temporary periodic exhibition, uh, new crates are being um, um, constructed. And because uh we put new things on the new crates, new ideas. Every crate is different from the other we one. We develop them. We it's develop a, them. Yes, it's a, it's a development process. So we we never better. use the same crate for a... Uh, so, so it sounds like a bit of a puzzle to put them together on a crate, uh, on a pallet. Is that correct? That they all have to fit together as boxes as well? Yes, it, it depends also of the, you know, the stability and... Um, the way, you mean the way they are put in the airplane pallets? Yes, that's yes. right. Yes, we, we, we try to make, um, we try to have a, uh, a specific thought on that, but uh, um, it's always, uh, it always depends on, on where the, air, the, the airplane company wants to place yes. these pallets. It depends on the aircraft, is, uh, it, it, it's not straight, and we have to, so we have to talk with these people. So it's a unique pallet every time with the Yes, unique, yes, uh, it depends yeah. on the size and the weight of the crates. It's time is time. Question from Arthur. Uh, uh, just a question about one of the exhibits rather than the I transportation. Can I, yes. can I just ask? Yes, yeah, yep. sure, sure. So uh, I'm uh, as I an e um, yes. oh, no, 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 no. Just from the internet. So they can see how the Got a question here, Peter. Yeah, got I'll a question here. I'll just take Arthur's first and then. Yeah, but that was first. Yeah, that oh, was first. first. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll come back to sure. the, the, the composition of the. Yes. Can, can I hear the question again? Um, yeah, just that the because the sculptures were over a period of time, the, the bronze, I was just uh, wondering whether they're all found, uh, the boundaries are in the same place in, say, Athens or um, but also whether you can tell from the sort of the DNA from the copper of where the copper was derived from, whether it was from Greece or whether it was outside of Greece, because mm. you know, like uh, silver and gold has its own footprints of mm -hmm. where it's come from. So just, just I guess, interested in the in the trade happening and the uh, construction way back then. Yes, uh, at the National Archaeological Museum, we have a laboratory called. 
physical chemical research and archaeometry. This goes into archaeometry that is provenance, for example, uh, technology, how these statues were made, uh, what is the analysis, what metals are in the alloy, all this is our, uh, goes into archaeometry. At the NAM, the National Archaeological Museum, we have um, an X-ray fluorescence uh, portable machine instrument, which can tell, can make an analysis. All these bronzes are an alloy of copper and tin. Uh, we don't do provenance studies, so we don't know what, where the copper comes from or the tin comes from, and this is a very specialized research area. But uh, this is the composition of bronzes. So can you tell where they actually came, this particular bronze was, which where the foundry was or where they made it? No. The sculptor uh, Kaloudis, uh, was he from the island somewhere, or was it from Nike? His name was Panagis Kaloudis. We have a picture at the, at the archive of him with a series of medals. They were, how do you say, Tuzdena de Metallia. Yeah, honorary, honorary medals. Honorary medals. It was a very big thing at the beginning of the century the 20th century to restore such a statue. So they were given by the government and by the king at the time, medals. Do you can see in this picture, that's why I asked, because uh, you are young. Yes, I mentioned the internal uh, skeleton that these statues have, because they were costed. They were empty inside. So we use this um, hollow in order to put the, the, the skeleton, the internal skeleton. I think this, this uh, you can see this, this is a part of the internal skeleton. Is yes, yes, thing? yes. Is it bronze as well? Or some yes, other it's bronze. Mm -hmm. All the statues I showed you were oh, are bronzes. The skeleton. Ah, the, the skeleton. Yes, yes. Nowadays we make it in stainless steel. But these, old ones but these old ones, the very old ones were um, iron, uh, then in 2000, around 2000 they were brass, but now we make them in steel, stainless steel. And then you have, uh, you can see the uh, horse from the trophy, how it was yes. found, the pieces, and you can see also the, uh, the internal structure, metal structure, mm -hmm. because it's still uh, around it. Yeah. So what survives from the horse is the part we can see here and the whole, the rest of it, it's a plaster reconstruction? Yes, for example, the tail is plaster. As I mean, well as the, uh, not, not plaster, epoxy resin. Nowadays we use mm. epoxy resin for adhesion of copper and uh, alloys. How are you questioning? Yes, uh, uh, as an engineer, I'm interested in the uh, Antikythera uh, mechanism. Oh. And um, there's been lots of theories about what that mechanism does, right? Has the museum come to a landing, come to a, an opinion of what it is and what it does? Does any of the archaeologists can answer let's this bring, question? Let's bring in one okay, of them. Mrs. Maria Hideroglu. The colleague, she's an archaeologist, and she's going to answer your question. Okay. Would you like to come? I think we're pretty fortunate today to be able to ask the people these, that deal these with these objects. Yeah. Thank you for your question. I am an archaeologist. I'm called Maria Kipiroglu. I'm super thrilled to be here with the team of us, the installing the installation, the, the exhibition, to answer your question. Uh, a, a team of experts from many fields, astronomers, mathematicians, uh, sculptors, engineers, uh, ep epigraphists, 
are studying the artifact. Uh, the studies so far have not been conclusive. All I can say, I mean from an archaeologist's point of view, is that you have a very special artifact consisting, consisting of discs uh, which, if put in function, if functioning as in antiquity, can uh, give you the dates of a number of specific events, such as Olympic Games, Nemean Games, Isthmian Games, and if in this same period you have an eclipse of the moon, an eclipse of the sun, which calendar, in antiquity there are a number of calendars. There was the Athenian calendar, there was the Theban calendar, there was the island calendar. Uh, so you can also have a picture of which calendar coincides with uh, which event, such as the eclipse or the full moon. Uh, this was uh, <clears throat> provided by this analog model of spheres and disks interacting with each other uh, that gave an analog image of the universe, of the known universe. So that's in very, very plain and rough words. Uh, the, the person who possessed such an instrument was most probably someone from the elite. He could foretell um, phenomena, astronomical phenomena known to people of the period. He could foretell if the set events or oh, a battle would coincide with something terrible in the sky, such as the black sky, I mean, total eclipse of, of the sun. So this is a, an, an instrument of power. Apart from a, a, an excellent analog computer, the first calculator, it's an instrument belonging to the elite. Of course, it harks back to Archimedes of Syracuse and theories on the spheres, how the spheres can interact. Uh, I'm no astronomer, but I know some of Kepler's uh, rules were seen that <laughs> they, they were known already. I mean, they, they have been found. These rules w were refound again in the medieval uh, period, but apparently some of this knowledge, not all of it, was already there in the, in the spheres, in Archimedes' uh, spheres. I, I haven't answered <laughs> completely your question because it's a large subject. Yeah. Uh, as I told you, there's a team of experts. From our epigraphists, I mentioned Nahara Abus Kurizas, who's, uh, who studied the inscriptions inside the mechanism. Uh, there are ongoing uh, research projects with various uh, Greek and international teams, uh, especially the effort of um, uh, antiquities of the coastline. Underwater, Underwater antiquities. It, uh, and the mechanism also dates in the second century BC. So a long time from Archimedes. It's not the only mechanism. Uh, in uh, the ancient sources, some more mechanisms are reported, not a large number, five or at most, at most 10. It's, uh, it's very, to put it very, very plainly, it's one of the first analog, not digital, of course, analog computers. Thank you. It's not, it's not very, very often on, uh, within a meter of an archaeologist, especially an eminent one. Um, I'd like to ask, what is what was your role in, in coming to Melbourne and or dismantling the, the project? So, thanking you again for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I am I, I, I'm a member of the Department of uh, Collections and Vases. Um, metal and minor arts artifacts. So the small objects, uh, mainly, uh, not the marble ones, the small objects come from my department. My head is uh, George, uh, head of department is George Cavadia. Uh, George was, uh, initialized the assemblage of the artifacts and the study of the artifacts. Uh, our role is to detect which artifacts can be the real storytellers here is an artifact with a depiction of Heracles in one of his labors, uh, telling us something. Is it a, a worth a, a storytelling, a worth uh, listening to, worth hearing? Or uh, is, um, for example, uh, 
uh, an ingot, a bronze ingot found in the, the sea coast of the island of Euboea, uh, worth uh, bringing here is the story to tell. For the, the ingot, in fact, which uh, dates, it belongs to another department, dating uh, here advantage. Uh, the Incot in fact uh, told us the story of um, contacts uh, from uh, Cyprus, between Cyprus and Euboea in the very early days. Uh, and Incot is a, an early monetary uh, object. So uh, trade, uh, trade connections um, in, the, in the period between uh, 1500 to 1400 uh, BC. Uh, our uh, main role, the archaeologist's role, is to tell the story of the objects. If the objects have meanings, uh, messages uh, that can be applied nowadays, such as this universal world of trade and connections, a free world of movement and connections, in an ethical way, of course, this is an artifact that can travel and tell its story. So trades, connections, open horizons for people, and the myths uh, that the ancient Greeks used to, to uh, penetrate in this symbolic language, to, to show it to people. Uh, our department uh, uh, assembled uh, a number of artifacts, approximately 20. 30, uh, all the small artifacts. The rest of the approximately 10 artifacts, 9, 10 or more, uh, come from the sculpture department. And I'm forgetting the prehistoric one with another number, the prehistoric department with a number of artifacts too. So the myths these objects tell us, and if these myths are interesting for the, the, the people nowadays, are they interesting? Do they have a story to say, to, to, to transfer to us, to tell us? And are there some that you never send out? Some of the objects have never been sent out. Some of the objects have also been uh, sent again. But uh, our effort is to try and find objects that have not traveled for many reasons. One is to be as original as possible. The other one, and I'm sure my colleagues from the conservation department will tell you, is not to put uh, too much strain on objects that have already uh, traveled uh, to China or to, to the States, for example. And, and uh, do tell us a little bit about the strains on bringing those objects. Are they like, uh, do they need to be rested or, uh, is, or do you rotate things so that they don't get worn or, or overused? In my department, we try to rotate things so that we don't uh, put strain on the object. They are fragile, they are, most of them, either of metal, of course, all of them, either of metal or of clay, pottery, such pottery, so damages are easily discernible. You can see it at first glance. So it's a good thing they travel in, uh, in perfect order so far. The National Archaeological Museum, thanks to all of my colleagues, uh, includes, including the, the perfect department of conservation. Uh, they, they have been made experts in this kind of uh, exhibition, organization, organizing, and uh, performing and putting it. Would anyone like or to, uh, like to ask anything of the conservator? Oh, sorry, not the conservator. Oh, sorry, not the conservator, the archaeologist. Uh, no, look, I'll, I'll just get to my question. Yeah, yeah, do, yes, fire away. Uh, thank you very much for uh, number one, the Horizons uh, exhibition. Absolutely astonishing. So it's such a wonderful thing to see here in Melbourne. Um, and also, thanks for bringing your team here today. It's really hot. Uh, on a regular visit to, to the NAM, and I was surprised to hear that there are over 20,000 uh, exhibits or items in the NAM. And of course, there's really, you know, probably on display less than a thousand uh, in the general area. So I'm just wondering, do you ever open up the, the museum to the public or to special guests yes. uh, to see, because clearly there must be, obviously, thousands 
The numbers are, are a bit misleading. Uh, we have how many objects on exhibition? Uh, more than 20. 11,000. More than, more than 11,000 objects are uh, on exhibition in a permanent exhibition in the National Archaeological Museum. There are thousands in the basement. Uh, there is a project called the VNC Museum, which focuses on bringing up objects from the storerooms every two months. No. objects that have stories to tell and they are presented to the public uh, I'm honored to be included in this team of uh, uh, people uh, presenting objects from the store to the public uh, this team is uh, headed by Kostas Paschalidis, Dr. Kostas Paschalidis my colleague from the prehistoric department and also in our team uh, these days is Dr. Prisanti Tsui so there is a project of bringing up uh, Hidden, hidden antiquities from the storerooms and presenting them to the public. And there are some plans for expansion of the museum. They are very vague uh, at the moment, so I won't go into that. But it's my understanding that there is an effort to uh, elaborate, to make bigger and better known the National Geological Museum in Athens. And uh, from this uh, stand, I would like to thank Karen, my, the conservator. I'm uh, going back to the open exhibition, to the open horizons exhibition. I want to thank my colleagues in the Marble Museum for assisting us and uh, helping us and uh, making Hi, it all uh, all easier for us. Karen is uh, Georgiana. Georgiana is colleague. And, uh, I want to question. Uh, I had the opportunity a couple of times to go to the main museum in Athens, and also the new one. But also, I was quite fascinated with the Byzantine Museum, and uh, th that's quite a huge area. You don't realise how, if you ever get a chance to go to, a lot of people don't go to the Byzantine one, which is I think close to the wall one. Sure. Oh. Going through another floor, another <coughs> floor under. It, it's like a kilometre under there. Of distance of uh, so many things, and it's not until you think, oh, no, there's another part to this. Um, and whether they could do the same thing in the main museum, then probably expand underneath. The late uh, head uh, of the museum, Dimitris Postantios, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, crucial, was the, the, the person that spearheaded the project of expansion mm -hmm. uh, in, since a decade or even before that. Uh, you see that even public museums make plans and uh, organize things so that they expand and make things better for the public. They are more uh, user friendly, if I may use The reason so. I was uh, interested in the Byzantine, uh, only here where I've come from myself, and I was born there, uh, we have a 12th century Byzantine church. Perfect. Uh, and it withstood the 1953 earthquake. It oh. the, the actual uh, ceiling had fallen down. Oh. But uh, the, the remainder had all stayed on, uh, and it's got some uh, beautiful uh, Fresco, frescoes. frescoes. But the original painting was on the uh, back of the altar, which is on the rock itself. And uh, there, there is a hole in the wall uh, where the first audio uh, speakers were made. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so century I, I speakers. Just thought... They're cones, uh, and the wall is so deep, and there's a <laughs> plethora of cones around which gives you the acoustics inside. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, uh, How interesting. Mind you, in the latest centuries of the 18th century, they wrecked the area because they put in windows. There was only one door originally in the actual place, so 13th century was the first. Uh, Hopefully we can conserve that. I, I, hope, I hope it is conserved. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, Doctor. <laughs> I hope it is the F4 of course, the F4 of. Uh, I, I just want to ask. Uh, I've got that one. No, 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 I can no, say two you. words. About certainly, certainly. About uh, uh, the Church of the Dormition of the Virgin in yeah. Alagi. I don't believe it's dating to the 12th century, because the oldest. Uh, evidence we have from written sources is 1565. Of course, it might be earlier, but not the 12th century. No, but it is very, very important mm -hmm. because the frescoes are excellent. And um, the, the wall of the temple is uh, dated 
uh, with an inscription to 1680. But the church is, of course, older than that. And I have um, made, uh, how, how you say, a study of how much it would cost to, to make a study, a proper study by an architect, a conservator, uh, a mechanical engineer to do uh, the improvement of the church in terms of uh, the frescoes, clean the frescoes, uh, stabilize the church, uh, see if it has any static problem. And uh, maybe the municipality is going to finance these studies. It would be great to see that, but also too, I think it needs uh, shutters to block out the light during the day. And yes. And, uh, uh, because uh, the amount of light that goes in mm -hmm. through summer and all year round, uh, it, it, it is deteriorating the Yes, the maybe. Mm -hmm. and in line with uh, questions about Ithaca. Yes. Uh, there's always talk about uh, Odysseus, and we always go back to him. Do you think there are any artifacts to be discovered in uh, places in Ithaca, like in the sea, <coughs> like between <coughs> Cephalonia and Ithaca? There's always been discussions that there's the lost. Uh, sorry, um, there's, all, there's been discussion about um, the lost uh, Odysseus uh, cities and uh, other artifacts being between Cephalonia and Ithaca. Do you believe there's other artifacts or places that you think may be found um, in or, or a possibility there? It is very unfortunate that the first finds in Ithaca were found by inappropriate people who took them abroad and many artifacts are in foreign museums or lost forever. Now, what uh, the, the excavation in um, Exohi, the school of Homer, all Ithacans, they want to attribute it to the palace of Odysseus, they are sure. But archeologists haven't found any dated finds from the Mycenaean period. This is very important. They have to be Mycenaean in order to be from the time of Odysseus. Uh, from what Paschalidis told me, our colleague, who had um, participated in the excavation by Kondorli Papadopoulou, the archaeologist who conducted the excavation, he said that there is a possibility to find Mycenaean finds in Vafi. In Vafi. Some uh, places are Mycenaean, but of course nobody can exclude the finding of something new. Mm -hmm. and but the uh, so school of Homer is wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you broke our hearts a little bit. There. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thickens, but we, we still we still uh, we still dream. Yeah. <laughs> But um, what about the, the area between yeah. Cephalonia and Ithaca? Do you think there's anything in the water that divers may have been? Nobody knows. Nobody knows, yeah. 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 Um, and, um, does anyone else want to ask? I just want to ask, any other questions? I'll open it to the floor, or there's quite a few. Yes, um, another question, a comment. A comment, like please. To come, uh, come, up, come up and... Come and up Dr. Chrysanthi Tsuli is an archaeologist for our team. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So there was a question made on the provenance of the bronze sculptures. If we know what is the provenance of the bronze. Maybe this is not known, but we have other artifacts that give us some clues on the provenance of the of the ship that was sunk. For example, the Antikythera shipwreck has on its cargo pottery and coins whose provenance is known. Pottery is very well dated, and we know the provenance of the clay, and so are uh, coins even, even more important than pottery in this case. So most of them come from Miletos and Ephesus in Asia Minor coast, and they are in such uh, numbers that we, we can say that they were not used for commerce, but that they came, came from these places, either the two of them or Delos, because more of the marble provenance of the marble artifacts are, is from Paros that was used 
for the Delia, from the Delian sculptors. So these are the three possible uh, origins of the of the seat of Antipater. Yeah, thanks, Brother. So, um, it, there was another question just here. Oh, was it similar? Uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just wondering, um, with no knowledge, um, if satellite imaging does anything for archaeology. I mean, can you look further with with satellites? Do they tell you more? I think they have some other geo scanning methods, uh, but. It's more technical. I don't. I think like a, like a hands-on type of. Uh, you have to be yes, on the ground. Yes, on the sea and on the ground oh. also. Uh, but can't comment further. Okay, thank that. you. That's so. Is there any any, uh, any other questions that um, Helena? Uh, I just wanted to ask about the moment when bronze sculptures are found in the sea and they're hoisted out by fishermen. At that point, when the team comes. In that first instance, is there a way that they are secured? Are they really fragile? Are they filled with some type of fill? How are they um, picked up that first time? If it is an organized excavation, all precautions are taken and uh, the site is organized in order to lift and put it immediately in water, in tap water. Well, in the beginning, it starts half sea water, half tap water. Then, during the desalination, one has to go to tap water, and then at the end, the ionized water or distilled water. And, and this I, is a very I, long procedure. And if I may add, I believe that uh, bronze statues, when they are found in in the uh, seabed, they're very rarely found as in one piece. Mm. Isn't that right? So you have like an arm, a head, a leg, or smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. And these, I think usually they're even from fishermen or from organized um, digs. Uh, they're, they're brought up with the sand that they are uh, digging to. And then as uh, Georgiana said, you put them each piece on uh, this process of desalinating them and they have crusts on them so actually you don't see a very uh clear picture of what you have in hand it's a long process yes, yes. definitely yes yes i'll show you some pictures that uh, might be downloaded from a publication we made on the Poseidon, Poseidon from Livadostra. this is a reconstruction how it would have originally been he would have called the Trian, Triena, and the Trident. dolphin. Trident. 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 This is the he this is the head that was found separate and the, separately. And the white and the white areas oh, are gap fills. Gap fills. These are with gap a, fills. With an epoxy. Epoxy, with an epoxy resin epoxy. gap fills. Th these are marks. Maybe they. Um, hit the statue in order to dis distract it mm -hmm. from antiquity. Uh, this is a picture with um, two sculptors and, uh, and an identified uh, person while working on the statue. This is a picture from the 1970 restoration. You see the right leg is gap filled. Mm -hmm. But then, nowadays we do minimal intervention. We never, we don't gap fill unless absolutely necessary for the static uh, behavior. Could you explain that for, for a layman? What the, the static behavior? The static. So, so basically. Okay, we usually don't gap fill. If something is missing, we leave it missing. missing. But sometimes it needs support, so then we get fill. With the product which doesn't. Uh, Either with plaster of Paris for the sculptures, or in epoxy resin. In uh, for the bronzes. For the bronzes. 
and that's the old um, okay. what you can see from the from the arm mm. it's the old it's the old inside structure metal structure or not yes what you see here are metal plates uh, at the time in 1897 they didn't have epoxy resins they didn't have structural resins so what they did they used the metal plates and screws and bolts and they perforated the walls of the statue in order to adhere to fragments. And you see the bolts and screw, screws. This is a, the X-ray of the interior. We see two horizontal plates and two vertical axes for the feet. Uh, for the legs and one vertical axis for the torso. torso. Yeah. There is also an endoscopic uh, image. We use endoscopes to see the interior apart from x-rays. Uh, this is um, what we call um, cartography. We, we um, Mapping, that's the word, <laughs> sorry. <It's all> right. <laughs> we do the mapping of all the evidence. For example, where are holes that were the, the perforation of the, where are defects that the ancient casters um, repaired, because we found many repairs, ancient repairs. And also we map our restoration interventions Here you see the right leg without the gut feeling. This is a mapping of uh, So the red areas are uh, the gut feeling, gut feeling used by us in 2016. This again is a picture with the leg <laughs> gut feel. This is the machine, the instrument I told you, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, this exact instrument belongs to Democritos, the national uh, uh, research institute uh, of atomic uh, research. And um, they did the analysis of the composition composition of the alloy. And here you see my colleague, Georgia Karamariu, working on the gap fields. And uh, Mike is Macris. Uh, this is a view of the Poseidon in the temporary exhibition of the Odyssey. Okay. I've just got my last question before yes. we wrap it up, uh, Minister. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe directed to all three of the conservators. Has there been any disasters that you don't want to tell anybody other than on film? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see I see one willing, uh, uh, I can see a story just, just right in, in, uh, in your Okay, place. I'll tell you a case. Uh, when we had this exhibition, the Greeks in the States, it was a temporary exhibition that went to Canada, to the States, it went to all different places. And when they came back, we had one crate inside which there was a dagger that was unstuck. It was not broken, it was just unstuck. The adhesive had failed. Oh, what a drama. Story. What a drama for the <laughs> Ministry of Culture. There's one object that is uh, unstuck. So they started uh, interviewing everybody, and uh, I had all the blame. Uh, but but that, what happened? But that, that just shows you how very important and how very, you know, people take these, uh, these artifacts. Absolutely. So we did all this investigation, and found, we found out that while this particular crate was in the airport airway transportation from the warehouse of the airplane 
to the airplane where we are not allowed to attend. It was tipped or it was something dropped, that happened. Maybe dropped. It was not our responsibility. Nevertheless, the ministry did the whole energy, the kipiki, etc. It was by law, all activities belong to the Greek state. Uh, we are just, uh, we take care of them, but they are not uh, part of a private collection. They are all belong to. You broke, you, you broke their toys, in another words. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what happened in the end there? It's okay, it was stuck again. And, <laughs> <laughs> and life goes on, as they say. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, everyone would like to thank you. So I, I think we've... Uh, had a real insight into the uh, intriguing and uh, uh, fascinating works of all uh, the archaeologists and the conservators and how I, I, it was just a wonderful uh, education to understand what goes on in these, uh, these um, uh, museums and, and these uh, displays. So we really thank you very much for, for, for this and uh, we invite you all to stay back for some uh, coffee and tea sandwiches and uh, uh, we really appreciate you all coming and um, we, uh, as a show of appreciation we're going to present uh, uh, oh, Dr. Well, thank you so much. for a copy of uh, the Independence which is our centenary wow. publication and so uh, thank you so much and uh, we look forward to it. So, and of course oh, very uh, we thank you very much for coming we really appreciate and Thank uh, you for having not, us. We, we, we're actually, I, I think, the other members within the copy of the book as well.